Igor, I want to bring you in on this because you, along with Ali, have been our eyes and ears in telling us what this has been like for you, for your country. You've shared what it's been like for your very young children and your family. And you were in Kyiv and you don't plan on going anywhere. Tell, tell me if you thought you'd ever be here on the one year anniversary of a, of a war. <laughs> Well, Nicole, surprisingly, I did. I was one of the few people, uh, you know, um, in the world, and me and other Ukrainians, let's put it this way, who knew we were not going to give up, who knew we were going to be here in a year's time. Maybe it was going to be difficult, but, you know, we were going to survive it. But the world didn't believe us. I mean, if you if you had asked anyone like a year ago, uh, who's more likely to visit Kiev soon, Biden or Putin? Most people would say Putin, because Kiev was going to fall in three days. And yet it didn't. And President Biden was standing here today. And I think it's a tribute to the Ukrainian people. And it's also a testament to the bravery of the uh, two men who are shaking hands in Kiev today. Igor, and pick up on, um, on um, Ali's point about fighting this war so courageously and so competently. I mean, I think it was Ambassador Bill Taylor who said that Ukraine's military is one of the best in the world because they've literally been at war for almost a decade. But talk about that, that analogy of fighting a war with a, a tank a quarter full. Well, we had to make do with what we had. I remember the first days of the war. By the way, I'll, I'll kind of work in the positive story right now. So I had a phone call from my <laughs> friend today. He, he was in one of those traffic jams on the 24th of February, 2022, trying to leave Ukraine under bombardment. And he was stuck in the traffic jam in central Kiev today as President Biden was visiting. And he goes, this is probably the most pleasant traffic jam of the year. So that's kind of the mood on the ground. Now, in terms of fighting, like, look, we had the resolve to defend our country. Obviously, I mean, we couldn't be picky. So everything was utilized. Only yesterday, I spoke with uh, one of the drone operators on the front lines who now has over 500 confirmed kills from drones. Now, think about it this way. First of all, how much... Ukrainian ingenuity plays a part in this, but also how much the world is changing because, you know, that kind of an achievement wasn't available to the best of snipers, you know, 50 years ago. And now we have students, we have like people who are like founding startups and going to university, being on the front line, deciding matters of life and death and winning against what used to be the second best army in the world, at least people thought so. Igor, how do you think this ends and when do you think it ends? Well, to be honest, I mean, that's another important point about the President Biden's visit to Kiev this week, because probably this is the uh, most decisive week of this war. And uh, originally it was all going to be about Russia. You know, President Putin has set up all the theatrics. He's going to be speaking to the, uh, you know, special sitting of the Federation Council tomorrow, then the UN uh, Security Council meeting, then the anniversary. We were expecting missile strikes on those and some schools are closing. So this week was going to be about Russia. Yet President Biden kind of acted proactively rather than reactively. He came to Kiev before Putin could launch his theatrics and said, like, look, we're here for the long run. Ukraine will not lose. And this is our stance. We're not losing this war. Now, it, any war ends uh, with negotiations. But we have to be in the best position possible to enter those negotiations. And for us, it's the 1991 recognized stakeholders. Mm hmm Ali, I wonder if there's any report you can share with us about how Biden, I know he's out of the country now, so there are less operational concerns, but I guess on, on the one right. hand, how, how we got there, how it stayed secret, and then how we got back out, and then whether there's more security now, whether, whether there's sort of a girding for any potential retaliation from Russia. Well, first of all, the person to tell us about how they kept the secret would be you. You're the, you, you, you know more about how they keep these secrets. I mean, that's kind of amazing that it's been in the works for months and, and nobody actually knew about it. We had heard little rumors around from people here who were in the know, uh, Ukrainians, uh, who had said they thought this was happening. But it all, you know, everything seems like speculation if you don't know. Um, Kiev is a very busy city. It's very, very active. It's a big, beautiful city. It's actually quiet tonight, in part because this whole area of town had been cleared out earlier, but it's snowing and 
and, and people have, have gone inside and gone home. Uh, but we've got St. Michael's behind us. This is exactly where President Biden was uh, with President Zelensky. They were walking around. It was a beautiful, it was a crisp, cold day, but it was beautiful. Um, as you know, he came in by train. It was a 10-hour train ride. I mean, Joe Biden likes the train. We know that. Uh, but this is something else. The security concerns around this are, are quite something. We know that there were uh, NATO and U.S. jets circling the Polish-Ukrainian border, because obviously there's a mm -hmm. danger of aircraft going into Ukraine at this point because of Russian fire. But we also know uh, from the White House that they had informed um, uh, Russia hours earlier. And, you know, I'd like to know the story behind that about, you know, are you informing them because you're saying that if you hit this train, you're going to to start a much bigger conflict than you thought you were? Or, you know, how did that all go down? We don't have all the details of that yet, but he came in. I mean, that is some determination. And I think Igor's point is, is valid. To be able to take the attention, the spotlight off of Russia and Putin and the attacks that we are likely expecting later in the, the week is something dramatic. However, Nicole, it is a poke in the eye. Uh, it's a really big poke in the eye. So there were provocations mm -hmm. that were expected this week anyway. And yes, this city is preparing for them, as is the whole of the country. Igor, what does, what does the person on the street say about Russia at this point when they've failed so publicly? And so, you know, what they're doing is terrorizing the civilian population because they haven't achieved their military aims on the battlefield. And it doesn't mean that they're not, you know, carrying out a brutal combat operation in the East, but the whole country lives under this threat. I mean, I, I think there are parts of the country that used to be perceived as safe, and now anywhere could be the site of a strike. What, what is sort of the psychological toll of a, of a year of living like that, Igor? Well, it's obviously difficult, but at the same time, I have some positive news. Basically, if you assess the uh, success ratio of psychological operations, uh, Russia is continuously trying to launch in Ukraine. I mean, they are becoming less and less effective. So people aren't afraid anymore. And to be honest, this is also why President Biden's visit is important, because, you know, it's disarmed Putin of his last weapon, fear. People think Russia is a joke at the moment. And like, we understand the gravity of the situation. We understand it's life and death. We know the missiles are real. But at the same time, you know, we go about our daily lives because this is the thing that Putin wants to take away from us. So, and we're not going to give it to him. Ali, um, I know you talk to all sorts of people in your reporting and in, in your trips, and, and I, I, you, you mentioned seeing some of them again. Are you hearing the same resolve? I mean, is, is this universal? Yes, it's amazing. I, 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 I would think after a year of war and winter and power outages, uh, the resolve would weaken. Not a single person has told me that this war should end before Russia leaves uh, Ukraine. And by the way, when people ask me about what I'm back for, and I say, you know, it's 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 a the one year anniversary of the war. Some Ukrainians sort of tilt their head a little bit and say, not really. It's the ninth anniversary of the Russian mm. invasion of Crimea. So so most Ukrainians are like, get out of Crimea too. That's the negotiation. Most people I talk to do not think that there is anything to negotiate away with Russia. That Russia has to leave, and that's the beginning of any conversations that begin about what the future looks like. There is no less resolve. There's no fatigue from it. They, they've tried. Igor makes the point. This is a reign of terror, taking out civilian infrastructure in the name of it being war infrastructure, power plants, electrical power plants so that people freeze during winter. Guess what? It didn't work. So I am kind of amazed at, at the fact that I found no weakening in the resolve of Ukrainians that I heard last year when I was talking to those women on train platforms in Poland and Hungary who had had to leave their, fa their family behind. The men had to stay while the women left. They had resolved then. They said they're coming back, and the resolve seems stronger today. Igor, and it's exactly what we've heard from you in these regular appearances. I, I, I think a lot of the credit goes to the Ukrainian people. It would appear from, from my distance that a lot of the credit also goes to your president, President Zelensky. Do you see it that way? I do see it that way. And to be honest, we're lucky in a sense, because usually the way the, a, any political system works, you have certain political elites and, you know, they compete amongst themselves. But we had a mini revolution in Ukraine, you know, when President Zelensky got elected. It was an electoral revolution. So people basically decided to pick a random guy from a crowd of Ukrainians who are all the same and let him lead the country. And that's what we have now. So he's become a perfect 
representation of the Ukrainian spirit and of pretty much any Ukrainian you speak to on the streets of Kiev or Lviv or anywhere else.